So this slide is a slide that we uh, completed in lecture yesterday, which outlines the formal process of changing the U.S. Constitution. And remember, there are two steps to this process. Each step has two options. Um, so you can go 1A to 2A or 1A to 2B, 1B to 2A or 1B to 2A, 2B. So um, any, any combination of these processes being fulfilled correctly will allow the Constitution to be formally changed. Um, more often, the way we affect uh, the basic rules of the political game is through informal change to the Constitution, change that does not follow uh, through the strict amendment process. And we've got a couple examples here uh, that we'll talk about um, with for informal changes and as historical examples of how we've seen this, right? Um, the first one is, is um, a formal institution of, of government uh, interpreting its own powers to extend those powers, right? In the, in the U.S. Supreme Court, in the court case Marbury versus Madison, uh, essentially, right, the, the, the case itself was, was one issue, right, what they were trying to decide, but in the argument to make the decision they wanted to make, the court interpreted the Constitution to mean something different than it had been taken to mean before to extend their own power. Um, this happens, or at least there are attempts for this to happen uh, in government quite often, actually, right? Uh, the, the plain words of legislation or the Constitution will say one thing, um, but the way we interpret them, read them, put uh, meaning to them will change over time. Um, and so doing that allows us, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing is to be debated, but doing that allows us uh, to give new meaning or new interpretation and to, uh, if it becomes accepted practice, to effectively change what the Constitution means without actually changing what the Constitution says. Um, so be aware, right, that any time an institution, whether that's being Congress or the presidency or the courts, tries to push a new narrative um, based upon words that are in the Constitution, if they're successful with that and if, uh, with, if enough people agree with it and feel that it makes sense, then that informal change will become practice. And if it becomes practice long enough, it's accepted. And that changes the impact and, and the, the meaning of the Constitution. Um, it's not the best way to go about things because it's not clear. Uh, it also means that it's a change like that can certainly be challenged again and again, uh, looking at the readings and the words of the Constitution. Uh, this is one of the problems um, that we have with the Second Amendment of the Constitution is that different groups of people read that amendment to mean different things based on, um, and if you, you know, you ought to, I shouldn't have to say this probably, but Second Amendment right is, is uh, right to bear arms. And the way that we interpret that or it will determine what we mean by it, right? Uh, and a lot of that interpretation revolves around the, the meaning of a, a well-regulated militia. And you can go a lot of different ways with that. And it's been challenged in court and Supreme Court has said that even though it talks about a militia, right, today that is being right translated to mean a right for individuals to have uh, weapons for self-protection. Whether that's what the founding fathers meant when they wrote the Second Amendment is almost immaterial at this point because we've right, argued the words to mean something different over time. Um, and you will see that this is a continual 
uh, argument and practice where we see people arguing for historical um, definitions versus plain meaning of the words being used today. Uh, and we do that in legislation. We do that in rulemaking for the executive branch. And it happens, obviously, in, in uh, constitutional interpretation by justices. Uh, so it's not at all unusual, um, but it can have profound impacts. Um, so judicial interpretation is one of those places we can certainly see uh, what the Constitution means being changed without actually uh, physically changing the words of the Constitution. Another could be changing political practices and what we use um, institutions in, in, the, in the government for or how we uh, put these institutions in place and what we expect out of these institutions, um, right? And I have here as an example, the Electoral College, right? Um, we see people getting uh, very agitated uh, when the results of the Electoral College don't meet up with the results of the popular vote in a presidential election. Um, and we see that motivating people to try and change uh, either how the Electoral College works, um, how you can undermine the Electoral College through some other kind of legitimate process, how you might even try to get rid of the Electoral College. Um, and so, right, all of those forces in the background are, are trying to impact what, what that institution does. Um, and so we'll see how that plays out over time. The fact that we've had, right, the Electoral College and popular presidential vote results differ a couple of times recently is, is, is um, right, seeding the ground for some, some new interpretation or new application for this, this institution. I think the biggest places that we see uh, informal changes to the Constitution, what the Constitution means, uh, comes from the way the world is changing. And most of that is, uh, is technological in, in its uh, scope. Uh, when the Constitution was written and uh, what the world looked like then compared to what the world is, is like today, um, we have to be able to look at things a little differently or maybe talk about things a little differently. Um, and, and, and we have, right? I mean, uh, the biggest one that's, that's easy, example that's easiest to point out is, is the Constitution giving uh, the power to declare war to the president, I mean, to the Congress. But the practice has been that the president engages us in armed conflict. Uh, the president is the the office, right? The uh, fulfilling the commander in chief role is the office that is most adept at responding quickly. And given the speed in which um, we have to respond to things around the world as a result of technology um, and the decisions that have to be made quickly, conferring with Congress and getting Congress to pass legislation is not always a practical thing to do. Right? Declaring war through an act of legislation in Congress is going to take a while. Um, but we know that uh, we have to respond to issues within hours, sometimes faster, right? Uh, and we expect our president to be responding uh, to issues around the world within hours. Uh, so uh, the, the, the speed of which things occur in the world and which we know about them and which we expect our government to respond to them, uh, in a sense, um, antiquates part, you know the constitutional constitution's processes that would require it to take much longer to be able to do that. And so, um, and we'll talk about this a, a little in depth later when we talk about the War Powers Resolution. But but the fact is is that all of us have, in a real sense, just accepted that it, the president has right at least uh, emergency uh, opportunity or authority to jump in and, and try and uh, address the situation. Uh, and, and even if that requires using force, using uh, troops. And so uh, technology certainly uh, puts an impact on those kind of things. Um, the fact that 
I have on here right now, nukes, nuclear weapons. Um, you know, countries like U.S. and France and, and uh, U.K. and and Russia and China, uh, Israel, right, uh, India, maybe Pakistan, all having nuclear weapons. Um, the time to respond to a nuclear threat is minutes. Um, I think if I remember correctly, in less than 30 minutes, somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 to 25 minutes, uh, an intercontinental ballistic missile can launch from Russia and land in the continental United States. Um, we can't be running to Congress to say, hey, what are, you know, are we going to declare war? <laughs> Uh, we don't have time for that, right? Now, if you wait that long, there's not going to be anything you can do. And so I mean, with the advent of, of technology like that, the response times are truncated and government has to issue policy change changes immediately. And uh, in this case, that, that policy change will land right squarely in the lap of the president to make a decision on how to respond to that. Uh, and, and I don't think anybody's going to really seriously make the argument that, well, uh, you shouldn't have that power, that power, that uh, ability, right? We, um, in, in, you know, in an ideal sense, you you hate having to put that kind of uh, uh, decision making power in the hands of one person. But in a realistic sense, if you don't, you don't respond at all, right? You know, you're not going to get a chance. Um, and so our expectations, the fourth thing here, right? Our expectations of government action. Um, require us to maybe look at the Constitution uh, in an updated fashion in, in a way that responds and makes it relevant to issues today. Uh, we could certainly follow up if we felt the need to with constitutional amendments, formal changes. Um, but that's not not been the, the history of the practice that we, we felt the need to actually do that. Uh, so in these ways, we can see what the Constitution means gets changed because of forces outside of the political, uh, the, the amendment political process and, and in, the, in, the, in the world, right, in the live response to what's going on in the world. Uh, and most of the time it's been for, for a, better, a better issue, uh, a, better, a better result. Um, does it make sense? Do you see how you know a different world, a quickly changing world, uh, forces us to maybe reinterpret and re rethink what the Constitution means. Thank you, Colton. Um, all right. So that's the last slide I think that I have um, you know, on uh, the Constitution um, and kind of how it is the way it is and why it is the way it is. Uh, the next um, topic, I believe, is federalism. So do we have any questions about constitutions, what they're for, how they work, what ours is, uh, is doing for us before we move on to the concept of federalism? So this chapter, I think it's now chapter chapter three, um, has us looking at uh, government from an organizational perspective. And federalism is uh, concerned exactly with the issue of organization, uh, you know, the design of the political system. Uh, the big term here, federalism, is referring to how we organize government and the nation that, that it governs um, around two or more levels of government and formal authority. Um, so essentially what we have, if you think about our situation here in the United States, uh, you're in Texas. You are subject 
uh, to multiple governments, right? Um, you're probably living in an incorporated area, a city, so you're going to have a, a city council that has authority to make resolutions and stuff that may impact you. Um, you have county governments, right, that you live within the county political boundaries, so that will impact you. Um, you have the state government, and then you have the federal government. So if you're living in a city, you've got at least four levels of government trying to exercise formal authority over you. Um, if you think about those, those go levels of government, they're also exercising formal authority over a, a demarcated area, right, over, over land. Uh, the city over the area that's within the city limits, right, the county, the county limits, the state, and then the U.S. government. So federalism is the study or the, the uh, understanding of how power uh, is separated, shared, used between these different levels of government um, over the same people and the same area. Uh, and so we're going to talk about different types of federalism. Uh, we're going to talk about what, how they work, and then we're going to dive a little deeper into the, the forms of federalism that we, we use today in the U.S. Um, so federalism is the overall topic, and that's a little, a little uh, confusing because one of the types of federalism that we're going to study is called federal federalism. <laughs> so um, just be aware of that, right? Um, so the first version or first type of um, federalism we want to talk about is unitary federalism. And this is where you have a federal government that holds all of the political power. And any smaller right levels of government underneath it get their power from that federal government. Uh, and a lot of nations are set up this way, where the national government is the sole source of political power. And it creates territories or states or cantons or regions, something, uh, governments. And then underneath that will be municipal or city governments or townships or something like that. Um, but all of those smaller levels of government are only there and only have power because the federal government created them and loaned power to them. And at any time the federal government says, all right, state, you're going to do X, they have to, right, under the, under the structures and the organizations that are built. Um, we don't do unitary government uh, in the United States. Uh, it's kind of contrary to our whole history and our perspective of, of how this is supposed to work. But a lot of other countries, especially ones that have, have developed out of monarchies, were fairly used to this, and that's the kind of design they've kept. And a monarchy is a form of unitary government. Um, and if you look at a lot of the democracies, um, not even democracies, but other, other governments as well throughout the world, they're unitary in nature. Um, the second, does that, does that make sense? It's, it's pretty clear cut, I think, right? All the power flows from the top to the bottom. Right? Everybody underneath the federal government does what they're told. The second version is the inverse of unitary power, and it's called confederal federalism. Uh, it's what we originally set up under the Articles of Confederation, right, um, here in the U.S., where the power, the political power, the formal authority is held by the smaller governments. In this case, when we had our first constitution, that power was held by state governments. And the federal government was created by those state governments and was dictated to by those state governments. So the federal government's job was to do what the state governments needed and what all of them right, coordinated that federal government to do. So the federal government under a confederal system answers to the smaller governments that actually hold the power. So our 13 original colonies that became states, right? And when they created the United States government, it could only do the things that the states had agreed to let it do. 
And at any time, if they didn't like what it's doing, they had the formal authority through the Articles of Confederation to change what they were letting the federal government do. Um, when the South, Southern states, right, um, right, seceded from the Union and started the Confederate States of America, right there in the beginning, right, the Confederate States, right, they built a, right, confederation where the state governments had the power over the Confederate States' formal federal government, right, so they went back to that. Um, Right. They didn't want to have another federal system that told the states what they had to do. So the Confederate States of America was organized around this confederal idea. Uh, and so it's, um, and this, this has a, a strong historical context for us, right? Throughout, throughout the, the, the history of the United States, we've had uh, this, this element of populism where people expect all levels of government to respond what to what the majority of the people actually want. Uh, and that, that is baked into who we are. And so uh, the, the idea that we would have a unitary system is just, is just not really that effective for us. Um, but we've had continual um, dalliances with the idea of confederalism because it, it squares up with uh, keeping the power vested in the people and closer to the people and further away from big, large governments. Now, of course, the whole reason we moved from a, the confederal system that the Articles of Confederation put into place to the Constitution that we have today is because it's not a system that lends itself to uh, federal action that can be responsive and responsible. And so the federal government, right, in that kind of system is, is hamstrung intentionally. Uh, and that's not a good thing when you're trying to organize large groups of people to try to get things going in one direction. And it's certainly not a good thing uh, when you're faced with an existential crisis like an invasion from an outside country or right, um, something that's going to put some kind of uh, um, immense pressure to act, for all of us to act the same way at the same time. Uh, and in those kind of situations, you're going to need a system where the larger overarching right umbrella form of government has the ability to lead all of us in one direction and get us going the way we need to uh, and confederal systems don't generally do that so when we move to the second uh, constitution we put into place a form of federalism that we refer to as federalism right it is a federal design and and essentially it is um a way of splitting power between federal, the federal government and the state governments, uh, giving each of them some of their own power, but also having places where they share power. Um, and so we're going to dive into that a good bit, right? Um, this is an image out of your textbook uh, showing how this works, right? Unitary system, right? The go national government has all the power and it flows down from that. Um, they describe right federalism with the federation system with the people having the power and splitting that people up between the two and that's true in a sense except that um most of the time when we're talking about a federated system we're talking about powers between here not starting off with the people now the way we've written this up and the way we've uh organized it this is this is a nice way to say that the authority Right, gets lent from the people to the to the to the governments, um, and then the confederation system over here, where the states direct the power, right, to the, toward the national government. We're going to spend our time, the rest of this chapter, talking about uh, this this place right here in the center. Right, we're going to spend our time talking about, and more specifically, we're going to look at how the power, right, is split and shared between these two governments right here. Um, the reason this, this kind of uh, diagram gives me a little bit of a angst is because there are places where the federal government does have an authority directly over the states. And so we kind of need an arrow, right, going from the national government to the state governments. Um, 
there's not much of a case where the states have one going back, but there's a large area where they share power and they cooperate. Uh, so the states have a say there. But there are some places where the national government right, actually has the authority to order the state governments to do things. Um, the states generally have a place where they have their own power and the federal government is not supposed to encroach on it. So that's a little different. So let's spend some time talking about uh, federation here. Um, all of these systems, right, do a few things for us. First, um, they split up power. They decentralize uh, the, the, the politics and the power that's going on uh, being exercised. And in the federalism system, there's a lot more of this than anywhere else, right? Um, so we have the opportunity as citizens of a city or a county or a state or the federal government, right, to take a lot of our problems to any one of those levels of government, or maybe all of them, right, and, and try to exercise uh, some due diligence to get things changed. So um, we have the opportunity, right, to, to involve lots of levels of government and have them work with or against each other. Uh, so decentralization is a really big idea about what federalism does, right? It, it doesn't uh, always say power sits only here, right? It gives you multiple places uh, to exercise politics uh, because there's power sitting in different places to be used. The fact that uh, the Constitution uh, right, delegates elections to the states ensures decentralization, right? Uh, we pick the folks that are going to work in federal government and represent us in federal government at the local slash state levels, right? Um, so here in Texas, right, we're we're electing two senators and 38 or so members of the House of Representatives. All 40 of those elections, right, are determined by Texas state law mostly um, and are uh, how they're run and when they're run. And then it's only Texans that live within the states or Texans within the particular house districts that make the decisions about who are going to represent them. So the politics is very decentralized there, right? California has nothing to say about who Texas sends to the House of Representatives or the Senate. Conversely, we have nothing to say about who they send. So that's decentralized, right? It's breaking that that power of who's going to be chosen to, to represent us and, and work at, at uh, the federal level down to much more local levels. Um, the other thing that happens here, because you have a federal and a state government, um, is that you're decentralizing policy development and policy implementation. Um, the, and we'll talk in, in depth about this as we go forward and talk about fiscal federalism, but um, a lot of our solutions uh, that we think, you know, up to solve problems that we need a policy for, uh, the federal government doesn't think those up. The federal government opens opportunities to the states to let the states do different things to solve the same problem. And then the federal government watches and, and sees which are more effective and then maybe takes those from the local areas and brings them up and makes a federal uh, initiative out of it. Uh, so the policy development can happen in a lot of different places, um, and it can be instituted or, or initiated by the federal government. They can tell the states, hey, we've got this problem across the U.S. Y'all figure out what you think is going to solve it in your state. Keep us surprised of what's going on. You know, here's some money or here's some guidance or here's some something, right? Go, go try to fix this. And then the federal government will pay attention to that as the states progress through, through the work. Uh, and so that's a good thing in a sense that it generates a lot of different uh, experimental designs that we can look at from the federal level and try to pick the best of the bunch. So again, the politics are decentralized and the policy development implementation are decentralized. So we're bringing essentially more people, more organizations, more groups into, into the discussion. 
And that's a direct result of this federal organization that we have that shares power and shares authority over these multiple governments um, and lets them do these things. Um, I want to make sure that the that one you know, you understand number one and number two here, right, of the decentralization and, and how this is uh, a really different kind of focus than than unitary governments will be looking at. Third place that we see federalism is that uh, when the Constitution, the second Constitution was written, there were powers um, and subject areas of, of exercise for power and politics that were reserved for the states. Um, policy areas that the, the, the framers said, look, these are generally going to be state issues most of the time. Um, and so we see now the 50 states right, being responsible for a lot of, of policy development that has to do with um, more personal uh, experiences at the, at the state level, social issues, uh, medical issues, health and welfare issues, family policy, um, whether that's uh, marriage or divorce or adoptions or child welfare, uh, social and moral issues, most of those, as we developed this system, those focuses were left to the states. The federal government didn't uh, have as much authority to act in these areas as as the states did. And, and the federal government, uh, realizing that the you know people are different across the country, wanted to let different policy be developed in different places to fit the people in those areas. And so. As they wrote the Constitution, the framers kind of siloed some of these things off toward the states um, to, to be the, the primary policy makers in those areas. Uh, that's important because that means while the federal government's not necessarily locked out of making policies in those areas, generally they're going to see what's going on at the state level first um, and maybe even decide um, if someone's coming up in you know, an organization or a group or people are saying, hey, federal government, you need to make a policy on this, um, they might often just say, no, we don't, right? The states are doing that and we're going to we're gonna stay out of that. So the design here allows a lot of uh, latitude for the states to be solving uh, policy issues in these areas and it allows the federal government not to have to get into that if they don't want to. Um, does that make sense? We'll have a slide here in a minute that'll do a lot better job of, of, of uh, delineating where these areas are. And I've already kind of given you an insight into number four, that states are policy laboratories. Right? When we de decentralize politics, we make the states responsible for a lot of these policy areas, we decentralize policy making, uh, the states, right, all may end up doing different things to solve the same problem. Uh, and that makes them laboratories in the sense that the federal government can be watching the states implement these policies, these different policies, solving, trying to solve the same problem and see what's, what's good or best or works. Um, and then uh, can draw attention to that to the other states and say, hey, states, you're all working on this issue. Have you looked at what Texas is doing lately? Uh, they seem to be making you know, good strides in this area. Maybe you all want to do that. Um, and so the federal government can be an information disseminator in that case that helps um, states uh, see different possibilities, but doesn't necessarily make them adopt it. Uh, so let's dive down into that just a little bit. Uh, how does the Constitution set this up? Um, the first place it sets it up is that it distinctly identifies uh, three powers that uh, protect the states from federal intervention and uh, allows them a scope to get things done. The first is, and we've talked about this a couple times already, that all the elections are seated at the state levels, right? The state 
laws govern the implementation of elections, how they go about doing the elections. There's some, obviously, um, legal guidelines and prescriptions that come from the federal government about who's eligible for office and by what time things need to be happening and what fairness uh, issues the states need to be engaging. Uh, but the states can go about doing their elections in a lot of different ways. And we're seeing debates about this right now, right, around the issue of, of mail-in ballots. Um, all states, right, have had the opportunities for people to go to polling places and vote. Most states, if not all states, have had absentee ballots, uh, which if you were, right, a citizen of a state and you were out of the country, you could request, or, or out of the state, and you could request an absentee ballot be sent to you so that you could vote back in your home state. Um, but mail-in ballots are a little different, and mail-in ballots are using ballots that you will mail in to actually vote, not because you're not in the state, but in lieu of going to a polling place. Um, and given the coronavirus right now, this has become a hot topic. Some states, because these decisions are made by state law, right? some states have had mail-in ballots for years, have been using this as a normal practice right, for uh, how they let their state citizens vote. Uh, in Texas, we do a thing called early voting, and most states, I think, do it as well, right? where we open a few polls right, a few weeks before usually a month or so or before the regular election day, and you have the opportunity to show up at those early election polls and vote without having to stand in long lines. Well, the same way that Texas does early early elections, some states have done mail-in ballots. And um, because, again, the responsibility for the elections has been through the Constitution formally given to the states. So the states have different rules about how you register to vote, and they have different rules, laws, about how you can vote. Um, and those differ from state to state, and uh, some states like what they're doing, don't like what others are doing. And uh, now we see, you know, with the coronavirus, there's been some push to get in, more, in states that don't do mail-in balloting to maybe do that so that people don't have to go to the polls. And there's been resistance to that. Um, so, you know, the states, the individual states will have to figure out how they're going to do it and if that's something they want to do over time. Uh, but again, it's, it's because the responsibility for elections sit with the states, they're the ones that make that decision. Um, our state representatives, right, will pass laws how, to determine how the elections go. And while the federal government, the president may want or not want one thing, they really don't have much uh, authority to say that they can or can't do this as long as what's being done at the state level is fair for American citizens across the board. Um, and so that's that's a right a, a large protection in a sense for the states because they control how they elect, who they elect, that's going to represent their state at the federal government. Right. The federal government doesn't have much say, uh, except in large organizational focus, about who's going to be coming to populate the federal government. Uh, the states have that say. And so uh, it, it protects the states from federal overreach, um, in, in a sense, because all of these representatives are elected at the state level. The second place... Um, is specifically in the Constitution, it says the federal government has an obligation uh, to guarantee states' uh, integrity and safety, right? So um, it's the federal government's job to protect states from invasion, uh, whether that be invasion from another state or whether that be invasion from another nation, right? It's the federal government's job is to ensure that states, right, are protected and um, so that's, that's an obligation that, that sits on the federal government and protects the states from, from outside interest that change, might want to change the way they do things. And uh, Luckily, we don't usually have much of a concern in this area. Um, and then the third one 
also in the Constitution formally is that the boundary of a state, once it is set, right, once it's brought into the union, that boundary, the political boundaries of that state, right, uh, cannot be changed by the federal government. The federal government may want to change them. The federal government may try to change them, but they have to do it with the concurrence of the state government and the, and the people who live in the states. So, uh, you know, if we federal government wanted to split California into two states, it could have discussions about it. It could talk about it. It could try to make arguments that it's a good idea. But if the population of California, right, uh, definitively continued to say, no, we're not going to do this, the federal government doesn't have the authority to change the boundaries of that state, which means when you're bringing that state in and you're setting those political boundaries, right, you're building an organization that's going to have power over people and area that the federal government's going to have to recognize and going to have to work with and sometimes just stay out of the way uh, of that group. Um, one of the interesting things about Texas is that when, when, when we joined, um, when we, we, through treaty, um, moved from being a nation to being a state in the United States, we preserved um, the ability to split our state into four states. Um, that disappeared in subsequent constitutions, but originally, right, we had reserved that as a state power uh, that if we, right, wanted to split our state up, we could without federal uh, agreements. The federal government couldn't do it, but we could. So uh, that's gone. It's not there any longer. Uh, but it was there as, as a, an artifact for a while in the 1845 Constitution, I believe. <clears throat> so um, that would have disappeared in the 1865 Constitution when we came back into, or 69 Constitution, the one where we came back into the United States after having left for the Confederacy. Um, the federal government was kind of in control of that point of all the the folks in power at the state levels. And so they wrote constitutions that limited the state's abilities to do things like that. Uh, that's where we also lost our uh, stated ability to secede that we had originally. Um, of course, we had seceded and that didn't work out so well. And the federal government was going to try to make sure that didn't happen again. Um, so that uh, was originally in our state constitution is no longer there also. Um, but the idea here is, is that right, once, once you build this political uh, organization, this state, uh, the federal government has to recognize it. It can't change it. It can't alter it. It can't take power away from it. It can't add power to it. Right? It's going to be set that way, and it's going to take a, an agreement between the state and the feds to change those political boundaries. So those are the constitutional protections or powers that are given uh, to the states that the federal government has to recognize and, and live up to as an obligation. So that being the case, right, we see in the Constitution, right, a separation of powers between a state government and a federal government, um, which means that there's going to be overlap. There's going to be places where the two governments are trying to do things at, at different uh go in different directions. Uh, and the framers knew this, so they put a couple things into place, right, to try to ensure that in some places it was uh, clear and demonstrable that federal power was to be exercised here. Uh, maybe there were places we'd share power and there would be state places for state power to be reserved just for the states. Uh, for the first topic there, where the federal government is supreme over the states, um, right, we, we have a couple things that tell us that, right? The Constitution, of course, is the U.S. Constitution is the fundamental law of the country. And uh, so what's ever in the Constitution is, right, law for both the federal government and the state government. So where in the Constitution it gives power to the federal government, right, it's 
it's giving that power and fully. And so the states do not have the ability legally to thwart that or stand against that. That gives, that puts power in the hands of the federal government. Um, and when we see the supremacy clause, right, uh, demonst it demonstrates that because right, it tells you that the powers that are vested in the federal government, in the constitution or through legislation that are made right properly by that federal government or treaties that are made by that federal government with another federal national government those are supreme those are things that are going to trump anything that the state wants to do in those areas uh, and so wherever right the constitution gives direct power to the government to the government's the federal government is in uh, a, a supreme a supremacy position there wherever the federal government through legislation right puts new laws into place those laws are right drawn up voted on and passed by representatives from the states so the fact that all of the states participated in that process and then the president signs it into law makes that law for all of the states as well right the federal government's laws are supreme to the states and the state's laws that they contradict. And then we can't have a smaller level of government thwarting the national government in the area of treaties between nations, right? If the federal government has a treaty, right, with another country, there has to be a guarantee that all of the smaller governments under that national government will follow that treaty or the treaty is not worth much. And so that's there as well. So in these three places, um, it's uh, fairly clear cut that number three is going to be the case. Uh, we argue a little bit about number one and number two. Uh, number one, we argue about the meaning of the words in the Constitution, about whether it gives the power supremely to the federal government in that area. There may be some debate. Um, and, and we'll do the same thing with what uh, the words mean in, in national legislation. But we're not actually arguing do they have the power we're arguing what is the interpretation of that power mean so in these three areas constitution uh, national legislation and national treaties uh, federal government is, is acting in an area where it has authority this is the um, uh, figure that i mentioned earlier that gives you a little better um, feel of, of what's what power exists where, and I want to I want to spend a little bit of time with this because it's it's um, it gives you a pretty decent feel about where the different levels of government have authority and where they work together. <clears throat> so um, we'll start under the federal government column over here, and we'll look at enumerated powers first. And enumerated means numbered or listed. Right. In this case, what it means is it's enumerated within the Constitution. Right. So these are the powers that if you look to the Constitution, you see that they right, are meant to be exercised by the federal government. The Constitution talks about right, the authority to coin money. Federal government has that enumerated power. Um, right. Regulating interstate commerce and foreign commerce. Now, Understand the difference between the words interstate and intrastate, right? Uh, interstate means commerce between the states. So if there's economic commerce transactions going on that cross state lines, the Constitution says the federal government has authority to regulate that. Uh, of course, what's being recognized here is that uh, under the Articles of Confederation, states were having obviously commerce going back and forth between them um, but they were co-equal powers these states and there was no way to say which state had more authority over a particular issue or not and there was no one power that could make a decision about this is the right way to do it or the wrong way to do it so uh, one of the recognized weaknesses under the confederation the articles of confederation was this interstate commerce and regulating it. So that was bumped up to the federal government to be able to handle these disputes that occur around interstate commerce uh, and to right, uh, direct the states that this is the way we're going to do it over time. Foreign commerce, um, 
right, is tied into that idea of a treaty between nations and there having to be one policy that exists between nation to nation and the states can't supplement that. Or, or, and so uh, the states, right, have to follow whatever the foreign commerce uh, indications or policy are by the federal government. We see this happen quite often. If you hear, right, paying attention to the news and you start hearing talk about trade wars, uh, about economic uh, treaties, right, uh, how we're levying taxes on imports, right, from, from particular countries. And uh, the states can't say, well, you can't make, right, that country pay imports that they're bringing it to our state, right? Um, if we ban imports of product from one country to our country, the states can't step out and say, well, that may work for the rest of y'all, but we really want those products and we're going to bring them in anyway. They can't. Right, the foreign commerce area is left to the federal government as a whole, and so the states have to follow that. In a state like Texas, that can sometimes be problematic because we, as a state, do have interactions with nation, right? Uh, uh, nation Mexico mainly, right, um, being right across the border from us. Right, we have a lot of commerce that goes on between Texas and Mexico. Uh, and a lot of it is is personal commerce and local commerce and state commerce. But the fact is, is when the federal government says, right, this is going to be the policy, Texas and all of those other entities have to follow that or be in violation of, of the law. So the Constitution enumerates that foreign commerce to the federal government. Uh, foreign affairs, right, same, same logic underneath that. Uh, rules of naturalization. Uh, this this makes a lot of sense, right? To be naturalized is the right the process that you go through to become a citizen of the national right government or the national uh, the country, and so it makes sense that the rules for naturalization would be established at the federal level, not at the state levels. We don't want 50 different ways to become a U.S. citizen, right? We want just one. Uh, counterfeiting goes hand in hand with the fact that the federal government's coining money. And they're going to have the authority, right, to investigate and punish those that violate that. Uh, yeah, I, I, let me back up a little bit on the coining money one, too, because that's, that one is, was important from our bad experiences under the Articles of Confederation, right? And one of the historical reasons that we had to have a new constitution, right, was that we had states coining their own money. Um, and that money wasn't good necessarily across state lines, or if it was, Right, it would be uh, right diminished in its value as it went across the state lines, uh, and what we really needed was a single unified currency so that commerce could easily go between the states. And so, coining the money gets set at the federal level so that it can it can be consistent between the states. Copyright laws, patent law, right? Um, it's a, a law that recognizes. Uh, who right copyrighted something or developed something and patented it with the federal government? Uh, you really want to have one clearinghouse for who has rights and ownership of something, not 50. So it made sense that that was there. Uh, the postal system, regulating the postal system. You notice right USPS, the United States Postal System. That's the only post that we have, right? Uh, the Delivery services that do packages, package deliveries, right? I do not have the authority to, right, deliver, right, first class mail uh, that, that belongs to the U.S. Postal Service. And of course, at the time that it was, right, put into place, uh, the federal government was really the only place that could make, make that work across the country. Um, and frankly, that's still true. Um, you know, we've had a lot of discussion about whether we sh still need the U.S. Postal Service and whether or not a, a UPS or FedEx or whoever could, could take those services on and do them themselves and, and maybe do them cheaper and maybe do them uh, more efficiently. Um, and that argument's made quite a bit, but when you go to the actual corporations, right, UPS and FedEx and uh, DHL or whatever, and ask them about doing it, they're like, not a chance, right? Uh, we don't want to do it. Um, we can't do it for the price that the federal government's doing it. And, uh, you know, it, it's just too big a job. We don't want to deal with it. Most people don't understand how big 
the U.S. Postal Service is. Um, so it's um, right now there's no corporation that's even willing to entertain the idea of trying to do what the U.S. Postal Service does. Right. Uh, I think I read not too long ago that they deliver. Um, is it a, 100 million pieces of mail a day or something like that it was some some phenomenal number um and 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 no one else is, is wanting to get anywhere close to that um but right it's 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 put there as a federal uh federal power establishing courts inferior to the supreme court um these are talking about federal courts um you know in the in the constitution the supreme court was the court that was mentioned Right, and then the power was there for more courts to be created. So, uh, right, federal courts can only be created by the federal government. Um, declaring war, right? We don't want one state, um, and Texas would be the state to do it. But we don't want one state, right, to go off and declare war against another country uh, and drag the United States into something. So this had to be unified and coordinated. Um, so. Um, and and it's um, historically right. Texas has, has actually played a large part in starting the, the um, Mexican American War. Um, so it's a, a nice historical kind of uh, journey into why this sits at the federal level and not at the state level. Um, raising and supporting armies. Uh, this is talking about federal armies. This is not. Um, it, it's unique, but it's not. Uh, completely, uh, I don't even know how to word this. Militias are uh, delivered or are designated differently than armies. And so states still have the ability, some states still have the ability and some states still have actual state militias. Um, but they cannot raise them and call them armies. They have to call them militias. Uh, and Texas is, of course, one of those states that has, has a militia, right? We have what's called the Texas uh, State Guard. Uh, that answers directly to the governor. Uh, the, it, if it were to be used as a war-making force, the federal government would step in real quick and try to try to uh, say, you can't do that, use it as an army, right? Uh, and, and to be fair, um, we haven't, right? So we use the Texas State Guard generally to respond with a coordinated and a, uh, response to emergency uh, situations. But... Uh, we do have a Texas Army, Texas Air Force, and a Texas Navy. Um, so uh, there's a little bit there, but the you know this is an enumerated power that exists at the federal level. And then you get the necessary and proper cause coming out of the, the Constitution telling us that the federal government can make all laws that are necessary and proper to carry out the above listed responsibilities. Uh, so they don't just have those enumerated powers, they have the ability to make law to implement and change those powers as they need and go forward, right? So this is a pretty big list that provides a pretty expansive scope uh, to powers that exist at the federal level. Um, you will generally need to know the powers. I'm not gonna um, give you a, a question where I say list the enumerated powers but you need to be able to kind of recognize them. Uh, good question, right? Um, pop those up just like that whenever you have them, right? Um, the powers that are denied to the federal government are, are um, interesting limitations, right, on where the federal government cannot extend itself. Uh, first, it cannot tax state export, exports. So, Right. While it's given control over interstate commerce, it cannot put a tax on the com commerce coming out of a state right, as an export. So uh, now it can tax imports coming in, but it can't, it can't tax a state. And the reasons behind that are is you don't want the federal government hampering a state's ability to do commerce and raise, you know, raise revenue for its, its citizens in, in, in the state. And, and so you didn't want to give a, this kind of hidden power to the federal government to put a tax, a, a tax on, a, on a product coming out of a particular state and maybe run that product 
uh, out of business or something, tax it out of existence. Uh, like we've already talked about the state boundary issue, right? They can't cannot change state boundaries. And right, the Bill of Rights, those those rights that are put into place that are uh, reserved as protections to the people or to the states, they can't val uh, violate those as well. I'm going to skip the middle column and go over to the state uh, powers. Now, we use a different terminology here where we were enumerating powers that belong to the state government. We're going to talk about powers that have been reserved for the state government. I'm sorry, enumerated powers for the federal government. We're going to talk about these powers that the states has as reserved powers. Uh, and the reason there's a different terminology, right, these were powers, right, um, that the states already had under the original Constitution. Uh, and so these were still reserved for the states. And not all states may be doing these, but just because they're not doesn't mean that the federal government can step in there. Only the state government, right, can exercise the reserved power. A lot of those enumerated powers for the federal government were carved out, right, of state powers and given to the federal government as we changed constitutions. But these were not. They were reserved. They stayed with the states or they were areas that were uh, given to the states that were going to stay state powers if they're used. Uh, first being regulating intrastate commerce. Texas gets to determine how commerce goes on within the state of Texas, right? Um, when this was written, this made sense, right? There was a lot of, most commerce was probably intrastate commerce, right? Unless you were living right on the state boundaries, most of your trade, most of your buying and selling went on within the state. Where we are today and the way the manufacturing and distribution process works today, intrastate is not nearly as large as it used to be, right? Um, normally, if I were in a classroom right now, I would ask people in the classroom, and I guess you can do this at, at your, in your, where you're sitting now, uh, to look around and try to find something that you can see that is only a product of intrastate commerce, right? Uh, and you're probably going to have a real hard time finding that. Right, almost everything that's manufactured and distributed today has right its origins all over the place, and it comes across state lines, it comes across national lines, um, and what that means is over time the way we do commerce has changed the power that the state has and reduced it, and probably not probably has increased that the power of the federal government has because more of our commerce has become interstate and less of it has is intrastate. Um, so it's, it's, um, it's hard to find uh, commercial products that everything about them was developed and built and made and uh, the transactions all occurred within the state, which is what intrastate commerce means. Uh, now, if you make something out of stuff that you grew, right, <laughs> um, and you make something out of it and you sell it to your next door neighbor, that's intrastate commerce. Uh, it's, and that's almost uh, the limitations of where we're at there. Uh, conduct elections, right, that's given directly to the states through the Constitution. We've talked about that. Uh, providing for public health, public safety, public welfare, pub and, and morals within the state what was carved out as reserved power to leave to the states. Um, and for the most part, this was true for a long time until uh, we started getting disagreements among the states about these areas. And those disagreements led to problems that um, between uh, different state citizens uh, or between U.S. citizens being how they're treated within a state. Uh, and at that point, uh, come a federal issue. So some of those become subject uh, to federal interpretation or federal input as well. Uh, but for the most part, this is still the domain of the state, right? Uh, and so uh, most of the rules and the laws, legislation that put into place about these start at the state level and most of them still stay at the state level. So federal government, uh, has the opportunity sometimes, but it's not its its place of, of 
normal business. Um, establishing local governments, right? Uh, particularly easily seen idea, right? Uh, in Texas, right? The state government loans power through the constitution to uh, create county governments and state government put into place legislation that uh, dictates how municipalities or cities uh, are organized and come into being and have to do that through uh, state recognition. So uh, state governments, local government, I mean, sorry, county governments, local governments, special district governments, all of those are, are regulated and controlled by the, uh, the power of the state, not the federal government. Uh, maintaining the militia, right, happens at the state level. Now, here you see it talks about the National Guard, right? So the states states have National Guards, right, that are made up, right, they exist within the state. Uh, and the National Guard is kind of a shared process between the states and the governments. The states maintain it. The federal government can call them into, into action and mobilize them. Um, the states can request that the federal government mobilize the National Guard to work within a state. Um, but these are different than the state militia that I talked about earlier in Texas, which is only the states, right? The National Guard is, is a mixture of uh, folks that have uh, made an oath to join the National Guard and the government, the federal uh, uh, military, but then are right regulated in a sense in uh, maintained at the state level. And then ratifying amendments to the Constitution. If you remember the formal process of changing the Constitution, uh, step two, which is a ratification of proposed amendments, is both of those 2A and 2B, right, are state actions that ratify that, either state legislators or state conventions that are ratifying constitutional changes, formal constitutional changes. So those are reserved powers, right, that uh, the states have the opportunity to, to make policy and implement policy at. There are a list of denied powers to the state, right, uh, things that they might have had the opportunity prior to the new constitution to exercise, but uh, don't any longer, right, taxing imports and exports. Again, that's interstate interstate commerce and so that's now federal coining money now federal treaties federal right so these are all things that are enumerated powers kind of that are sitting over there uh, these these first three are all sitting over there as enumerated federal powers now uh, impaired obligation of contracts um, so this is this is a, a, a unique piece of, of law that has to be determined at right because a lot of times the states are going to be uh, part of this uh, and so uh, they can't be a decider in their own issues and so those obligations that they're under with, through contracts have to be handled through federal court um, abridging the privileges and immunities of citizens or denying the due process and equal protection of the laws um, right so 14th amendment um, and it's basically a saying, look, U.S. citizens have a set of privileges and immunities as United States citizens. And when those citizens right, are, are also state citizens, I mean, they are also state citizens, um, but they cannot be denied their federal protections, their federal privileges, their federal immunities by being in a state that is has trying to do something different. Right. And so this is ensuring that all U.S. citizens get to exercise their full rights, privileges and immunities as U.S. citizens, regardless of the state that they're in. Right. Um, and this, of course, is uh, the springboard for trying to ensure that uh, whatever kind of, of uh, civil rights issues we have. Right. This is this is the federal. Uh, doorway to coming in and trying to make sure that those are corrected because we, all citizens, regardless of race, color, creed, right, religion, age, ability, uh, gender, right, they all have rights as citizens, all of us do, right, um, as U.S. citizens, and, and the states can't, um, shouldn't, and legally cannot be um, abridging those. In the middle, 
are powers that are shared or can be uh, used by either, right? So we call these concurrent powers, meaning existing in both places concurrently at the same time, same place, right? Levying and collecting taxes, right? Um, states can collect taxes. States can levy taxes, right? Federal government can levy and collect taxes. They, they're both doing this. They're different taxes, but they can both do this. It's not unique to one. Um, both federal and states have the authority to borrow money so that they can do uh, large scale projects, right? And then, and then pay that back through a loan process or a, a bond process or something, right? Um, actually making law and enforcing law, right? Federal law is being made by the federal government, enforced by the federal government. State law, right? Made and enforced at the state level. As long as those aren't conflicting, right? Both of those can be in effect. Uh, we have right state courts that, that implement and, and make decisions and interpret uh, state law and federal courts to do it at the federal level. Okay. Um, and there are opportunities where those laws overlap and allow cases uh, to move from state courts and to, to move over and become a federal court case. Uh, right? There are provisions in place that allow that. So Again, concurrent powers, right? We're sharing these. Uh, banks and corporations, right? Uh, Texas and corp banks, Texas incorporates companies, but so does the federal government. So we're doing some of the same work, um, and it's effective to be done at either place. So these are con con concurrent powers, right? Um, eminent domain, right? The taking of property for public use. Um, Texas does that, has that ability to exercise eminent domain and take property of its citizens inside the, the boundaries of Texas. The federal government can do that as well. We're seeing this right now along uh, the Rio Grande, right? As the federal government is building a border wall, right? A lot of the land that goes up to the, the national border is owned by private individuals. And the federal government is right, using eminent domain to take control of that property so that they can build a federal border wall. Uh, sometimes that's not a problem. Sometimes it's a very big problem, right? And so, uh, and Texas, of course, is having, you know, I think most, the most amount of border property among the, the states that border Mexico. I think we're, if I remember right, having the biggest uh, eminent domain issues uh, in this area, Part, partially because a lot of uh, borderland in uh, in New Mexico and Arizona is actually or big portions of it are owned by the federal government. So they don't have an eminent domain issue. Uh, in Texas, uh, it's, it's a lot of it is privately owned. Um, so these areas here in the middle, right, both of them have these powers. They don't necessarily overlap, but they might. Um, and this is a uh, prime places for us to have some issues that involve both the state and the local, I mean, state and federal governments.